Good afternoon. My name is Sarit Katan Gribitz. I am an Associate Professor of Judaism in the Theology Department at Fordham University and the Acting Director of the Center for Jewish Studies. I want to welcome all of you virtually to our community, whether you're a regular at our events or if this is your first time, and to thank you for joining us today for our first virtual book club featuring Eva Morocek in conversation with Karina Martin-Hogan and Karen Stern. Before I introduce today's speakers, I want to invite you to our many upcoming spring semester events. You can find more information and registration links on our blog and through our weekly newsletter. Our next event will take place on Wednesday, March 10th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and will feature a lecture by Hanan Maze of Ben Gurion University titled The Land of Israel or Syria Palestina, Reconceptualization of Territory in Rabbinic Literature. This talk will be of interest both to those who are curious about the ancient world and rabbinic texts and also those curious about notions of space and territory and the long history of the region. I encourage you all to attend and I will in a moment place the registration link into the chat so that you have it easily accessible. Today's book club event is a partnership between Fordham's Center for Jewish Studies and the CUNY Graduate Center. For a couple of years, we held in-person book club events featuring Jessica Morglin's Across Legal Lines, Jews and Muslims in Modern Morocco, Lisa Left's The Archive Thief, the Man Who Salvaged French Jewish History in the Wake of the Holocaust, and James Whitman's Hitler's American Model, The United States and the Making of Nazi Race Law. Each event has been a wonderful opportunity for members of our community to read shared books and discuss them together with their authors. I want to thank Francesca Bregoli at CUNY and Magda Tedder and Siobhan Verleza at Fordham for all of their efforts to make these events happen. I'm especially pleased that we're gathered to here today. Exactly a year ago, in March 2020, we planned on hosting Ava Morocek here in New York, and this book club event was the first to be canceled because of the pandemic. I'm grateful to her and to Karina and Karen for agreeing to gather virtually this March instead. Much has happened in the intervening year, including how we disseminate knowledge, circulate texts, and gather to read and converse. And so there's something wonderful about being able to discuss a book, Eva Morocek's The Literary Imagination in Jewish Antiquity, focused on the composition and transmission of ancient literature after a year in which our own relationship to digital and printed materials have no doubt been altered. I'm thrilled to introduce my three colleagues for what I'm sure will be a thought-provoking and exciting conversation. Eva Morocek is Associate Professor of Religious Studies and Director of the Jewish Studies Program at the University of California at Davis. She received her PhD from the Center for the Study of Religion and the Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Toronto. Her first book, which we're discussing today, was a finalist for the 2018 AJS Jordan Schnitzer Book Prize, winner of the 2007 DeLong Book, Pri Book History Prize awarded by the Society for the History of Authorship, Reading and Publishing, and the winner of the 2017 Manfred Lautenschlager Prize for Theological Promise. She is currently working on two new projects, Out of the Cave, The Possibility of a New Scriptural Past, An Intellectual History of Manuscript Discovery Stories, and A Guide to Imaginary Books in Ancient and Medieval Jewish Lore. And I hope that we'll have an opportunity today to hear a bit about how Ava's first book led her to these current projects. Joining Ava in conversation is Karina Martin-Hogan, Associate Professor of Biblical Studies and Ancient Judaism at Fordham University and the Director of Fordham College at Lincoln Center's Honors Program. Karina received her PhD from the University of Chicago Divinity School. She is the author of a book titled Theologies in Conflict in Fourth Ezra, Wisdom Debate and Apocalyptic Solution, and co-editor of two volumes, the first titled Pedagogy in Ancient Judaism and Early Christianity, and the second titled The Other in Second Temple Judaism, 
and numerous articles. Also joining the conversation is Karen Stern, Professor of History and Tao Professor at Brooklyn College. Karen received her PhD from the Religious Studies Department at Brown University. She is the author of Inscribing Devotion and Death, Archaeological Evidence for Jewish Populations of North Africa, and Writing on the Wall, Graffiti and the Forgotten Jews of Antiquity, winner of a 2020 Jordan Schnitzer Book Award through the Association for Jewish Studies. Karen has also conducted archeological research throughout the Mediterranean region, including Petra, Sepphoris, Pelos, and Athens. I could of course fill the hour uh, just telling you about their amazing accomplishments um, and how much I respect them and their work in the field and how much I personally have learned from them. But instead, I will thank them for joining um, and stop my introductions here. During um, and after the talk, I want to encourage you to submit your questions through the Q&A button on the bottom of your Zoom screens. Ava will speak for about 10 minutes or so, um, introducing us to her book, after which Karina will offer her reflections and questions, and Karen will offer her remarks and questions as well. Ava, Karina, and Karen will be in dialogue with one another, and then all have a chance to jump in and ask them questions from you. If we don't manage to ask all submitted questions, we'll be sure to share them with the speakers after the talk. Ava, Karina, and Karen, thank you all for being here with us today and sharing your work with us. Thank you, Sarit. Um, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful introduction. And thank you, uh, Sarit and uh, Magda, for the invitation to the book club. Um, and for Siobhan, to Siobhan for coordinating the event, and uh, Karen and Karina for your scholarship and your deep engagement uh, with uh, my work. Now, it has been uh, almost five years since this book came out. And I am absolutely thrilled that it continues to be something that people find uh, worthy of engagement, worth uh, talking about and reading. And I'm really thrilled with uh, how people have uh, taken up and expanded on and challenged some parts of the book since it's been out. So uh, for me, this marks uh, a really wonderful opportunity to reflect a little bit on um, how I see it now uh, from in, in hindsight and where I see the next steps uh, coming as part of the scholarly community in early Judaism and the history of the formation of, um, of scripture and literature. Um, and I'm particularly grateful for all the students who are here today. Uh, thank you for being here. I know there's a lot to read and there's a lot to attend. I'm going to lay out some of the things that I hope that the book accomplished and tell a little bit about its origin story, especially for the benefit of students and those who are new to the field or haven't, um, haven't had a chance to read the book. And um, to those who have heard me speak about this before, I hope that there will be some um, new material to discuss, especially in our Q&A uh, afterwards. Um, so the main question, the main research question that drove this whole book and that really still drives my research is what were Jewish sacred texts shaped like before they were shaped like the Bible? How were they imagined? What was the perception of what they were like? And the background for this is really the challenge of what the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, contributed to our understanding of the history of early Jewish literature and the formation of uh, scriptural texts. And as uh, many of us know, uh, uh, at uh, Qumran, the site of the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, the discovery yielded every book of the Tanakh of uh, the Jewish scriptures, except for Esther. Um, but those books came in different versions. So for example, two editions of the book of Jeremiah, two editions of Exodus, and a wide variety of collections of Psalms. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so there are different textual forms of these books. There are variants, small and large, showing that the textual forms of the books that we know from our Bible were not exactly quite set yet. Um, they were still being changed and revised, but that wasn't it, right? We also found other texts that were not found in the Tanakh and that are not found in most Christian Bibles, like the Book of Jubilees, a second century BCE retelling 
of the primordial history of Israel that roughly follows Genesis and parts of Exodus, but is retold. Uh, books of Enoch about the heavenly journeys and visions of a great uh, pre-flood patriarch, and other uh, texts that seem to have a lot of authority, a lot of significance, were copied multiple times, but we do not now consider biblical. Um, so we so besides the sort of uh, uh, um, discovery that the texts of the Bible were in flux and there were other texts that were recognized, um, what I was most interested in is that the entire concept of a canon, the entire concept of a Bible that is supposed to have a specific table of contents, a beginning and an end, right, and a set text inside it, that that didn't really exist as a concept yet. It didn't seem like the boundary or the difference between biblical and non-biblical was invented yet, right? And that presents a bit of a problem because for us, the Bible is such a powerful naturalized category to think with, right? When we think about sacred texts, when we think about uh, literature that is somehow inspired or, or, or authoritative, what we're used to thinking about is something that is collected together in a book and fixed in a particular textual form that is always supposed to be the same, right? So those are the values that we tend to associate with scripture, right? That it's set, that it's the same, that it's stable, that we know what's in it. Um, now, of course, we know even now that that's not correct because here are my three Bibles that I just pulled off the shelf that belong to three different communities have different contents and orders and very different histories of how they're interpreted and how uh, they function in a community. So even now the idea that, uh, that the Bible is always the same is simply not accurate. But before there was a category of Bible, before there was even a distinction that people had in their head that some things were biblical and some things were not, we have to allow ourselves to think about a really different set of values and metaphors and ways to imagine what sacred text is like, right? So the way that I went about uh, um, writing this book is to listen to what the ancient writers themselves had to say about their ideas of sacred text. What was it like? Where was it found? Where did it come from? And it certainly didn't look really anything like our modern Bibles. Um, the ways that, that these texts were imagined, as I showed through specific case studies, was that sometimes we get this sense of a huge repertoire of heavenly revelation that's reflected only partly in available texts, right? Not fully there, just maybe out there in heaven or somewhere not totally accessible. Sometimes it was imagined as a long history of revealed writings given to successive generations of patriarchs over time. Every patriarch had a story of writing that was passed down. And sometimes it was imagined as this vast flowing river that never stopped and that nobody could ever quite fathom the depths. So you see that, and, and, and often when these ancient writers are talking about, about uh, their own sacred texts, those texts absolutely don't look like the texts that we associate with the Bible. And they're certainly not shaped that way. Now, to say something about the origin story of this project, and I know uh, many people who are here have been listening to me talk about this text for 16 years, um, indeed, but I'm going to talk about it once again. Uh, this is one particular passage from the Great Psalm Scroll, and the Great Psalm Scroll is the longest uh, collection of psalms found at Qumran, found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. It has 50 compositions. Um, just uh, 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 for the record, the biblical book of Psalms has 150 or 151 Psalms in it. This one is the longest at Qumran. It has 50. Uh, 10 of those are not found in any biblical book of Psalms, and the order is really completely different. Now, near the end of that scroll is this really extraordinary poem that really set me off an entire research trajectory that continues now. This is um, a passage it's uh, uh, that that uh, talks about King David as an exemplary figure, an exemplary hero who's prophetically inspired 
who's in fact glowing, right? The way that some of these, uh, these figures who have had contact with the divine, their faces glow, like Moses's face glows when he comes down from Sinai. Here, David too is luminous and he's a scribe who's res responsible for writing Psalms. And this really struck me because here in this passage, uh, whoever wrote this great uh, passage of praise to David was imagining David's Psalms as a kind of cosmically ordered corpus. It's really according to the calendar, right? According to the liturgical calendar. And it, we come up with this vast number, 4,050 Psalms that David uh, spoke, that David uttered through prophecy, right? So these are divinely inspired texts. They're vast. There's this huge, huge collection of them. Um, and they, they come from God and they're somehow cosmically arranged around the calendar. Now, how did I read this text? Well, the interesting thing to me is that I encountered this text because before I had really any fixed ideas about the history of the Bible or its authorship before I was really very familiar with biblical studies as a field, right? I came to this text with some background in philosophy, with a deep interest in literature, and with the help of an incredibly creative and open-minded teacher, uh, Hindi Nyman, who was my doctoral advisor, who allowed me to read this text on its own terms and find what struck me about that text itself without immediately directing me to the history of biblical scholarship on the book of Psalms. So what struck me about this text is this vast proliferation of inspired song, 4,050. Later, I traced this back. This is a, a, a kind of allusion to a note about Solomon's great prolific uh, productivity of, of proverbs and songs. And also this picture of a figure who is completely different from his biblical portrayal, who is a scribe, who is a wise man, and who has this divine luminosity, uh, and who receives this vast, vast revelation. Now, only later did I find out um, that this passage was primarily used to answer questions about something else, to answer questions about the history and authority of the book of Psalms and uh, ideas about its, um, its authorship. Now, when I figured out that uh, people were using this text in that way, I was frankly a little bit confused because to me, I saw this and I thought, this has nothing to do with the book of Psalms. This has nothing to do with a set biblical collection. This is an imagined idea of what sacred uh, revelation is like, how it's linked to this expanded biography of an inspiring figure. And so I had to kind of reconstruct uh, the main interests and aims and habits of biblical scholars to figure out how most people were um, approaching this material. So this project really then began with the debates that I dug up about the book of Psalms and its status uh, at in, in the Dead Sea Scrolls and in Second Temple Judaism. So I started looking at the evidence for what Psalms were like and how Psalms were understood in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, one of the things that, that most students of the Dead Sea Scrolls are taught is um, that uh, there were 36 copies, sometimes that varies, 35, 36 copies of the Book of Psalms, and that the Book of Psalms is very, very widely attested in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And that means that the Book of Psalms was a really important biblical book in second, at Qumran and in Second Temple Judaism. But then I started digging around at the, uh, and looking at uh, records of the manuscripts themselves. What counts as a copy of the Book of Psalms in kind of the standard, uh, uh, the standard scholarship here uh, in some, uh, you know, the, the sort of textbook list of the uh, uh, books of Psalms at Qumran. And it turned out that these 36 scrolls were not copies of the same work at all that there are 36 manuscripts that contain psalms, but they range from being just one psalm in a small copy, maybe for personal devotional use, maybe four psalms that are about a particular theme like exorcism, all the way up to 50 psalms, that is the longest collection. And none of those texts look anything like the book of Psalms with its 150 texts that we have in uh, Jewish and Christian Bibles now, or 151. 
So the idea that there are 36 copies of one biblical book really has to do with the questions that we're asking. If we're looking for the history of this later formation, then we're going to find evidence for that, even if that evidence is of something else, right? So the book of Psalms, or by extension, the Bible acts like a kind of magnet, right? If you're already holding this magnet and you're looking around, everything will stick to it. Or if you already have this mental container that's shaped like the book of Psalms, everything will just flow into that. Where if you're just looking at it without that container, it might look like a very different network, a very different collection of different kinds of literature. So the connection between this uh, sort of material situation of all of these different uh, types of collections and types of lengths of, of Psalms connected with this composition about David, how are those two things related? Well, this was really sort of the origin of, of the theory about how people imagine scripture or sacred texts before the books of the Bible or before the, the Bible itself as a unified entity existed. So my sense here is that uh, we've got an imagined repertoire of revelation that is huge, that's not found in any single collection fully, right? But that's scattered piecemeal and incompletely across different available material texts. So um, I started to paint this kind of picture of, of the scriptural imagination or, the imag or, or how people imagined their own sacred literature that was larger than anything anyone could possibly possess. And I started to think uh, about looking at different uh, case studies here and the case studies that I chose were pretty deliberately chosen. The Book of Jubilees, uh, which exists uh, in fragments in Hebrew from the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Book of Ben Sira, which we also have in Hebrew fragments. Uh, one problem with the field of early Judaism is that a lot of our materials are only uh, extant, have only survived because Christian scribes many hundreds of years later copied them. But the case studies that I chose to focus on did have a pretty good attestation for uh, the period of, of, of Second Temple Judaism. Um, so in the other examples uh, I looked at, just uh, sketching this out very, very briefly, the Book of Jubilees, um, I'm going to start with Ben Sira, the Book of Ben Sira, which is a, a collection of uh, wisdom and instruction from uh, a person who is uh, the first uh, apparently named author. Uh, in a culture of, of mostly anonymous and pseudepigraphic texts. This is a complex question that uh, Ben Wright, who I think is here today and I have uh, have worked on. Um, but the way that Ben Sira talks about Torah or written tradition or uh, written revelation is also in terms of these uh, of this uh, continuous flowing and changing and growing corpus. All right, he talks about the scribe and I think he's um, uh, talking about himself a little bit here, that he seeks out the wisdom of the ancients and pours forth wisdom. So there's this kind of forward moving idea of tradition. And this continues in one of the most profound metaphors, I think, of what Torah or tradition is, um, that uh, for Ben Sira, it's like a river, a river that overflows, that runs over, that pours out. And in fact, the tradition is not something that anyone has ever fully known. Um, and he himself thinks about his own role as a kind of channeler of this uh, corpus of tradition that is far, far uh, wider and broader and longer than, um, than his own knowledge and his, his own text. Um, so what came out of all this is that I, I think I tried to sketch out what it might look like to imagine a different set of values, right? A different set of ideologies, associations, and metaphors associated with sacred text. Um, and I kept on coming upon these themes of incompleteness. We don't have everything. Scripture or revealed text is a much, much larger phenomenon than any human scribe has ever been able to grasp. This idea of proliferation, David's thousands of Psalms, this ever flowing river that keeps on flowing over its banks. Um, so ancient writers, based on a lot of these case studies and other, uh, other literary evidence, 
they knew that the text that they possessed were not the full and sufficient record of revelation, but that revelation continued to move. And imagining sacred writings as a much larger and not wholly accessible corpus, right? So it's a concept of sacred text that is different from the idea of the Bible as, as a complete and stable corpus of revelation, the way that we uh, see it in some, some religious traditions, right? The idea that the potential corpus of sacred text was vast and elusive also was generative. It was generative for new production, for the production of new literature. Now, I'll say a couple of things very quickly about the new directions that arose from the book since its publication. Um, and um, I did miss my, um, my material about Jubilees. I think I'm going to mostly skip that. Um, the other case study was about a sacred text as a story, as a story of written revelation that goes down through generations of patriarchs. And the book of Jubilees, which rewrites Genesis and Exodus, isn't setting up Genesis and Exodus as its uh, claimed authority. The claimed authority there is an imagined uh, uh, writing on heavenly tablets that is reflected in partial ways through patriarchal writing over time. Um, now, related to this, in fact, is um, one of my new projects called Out of the Cave, where I'm looking at uh, a very long history um, of uh, narratives of texts that are discovered, right? Manuscripts that are found. And uh, these are both ancient and modern uh, narratives. Of course, uh, the, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls is one example of such a narrative. That one is true, but it is also told in a certain way. And I'm looking at uh, discovery narratives as an example of a genre of religious writing. Um, as a genre of religious writing that tells us something about the values that inform how people think about sacred text and its availability and its history and its potential. The idea that there's this constant, very long tradition of people telling very similar stories about hidden and recovered texts tells us something about the horizons of the imagination and what scripture means uh, in those contexts. And related to that is um, work that's uh, been part of a project um, at the Center for Advanced Study in Oslo, Norway, books known only by title, where we're looking at uh, uh, ancient books that don't exist as texts, but that are only referenced, remembered, and gestured toward in pre-modern literatures. And I think here, um, the the idea of imaginary books, I want to think about think hard about imaginary books as part of the literary landscape, even though they don't exist. Because as we see in some Second Temple literature, books that don't actually exist, like the Heavenly Tablets and Jubilees, they are they have relationships and they inform the way that we read the text we do have. Um, so I'm looking at, uh, at mapping, because I'm kind of drawing on Molly Zahn's language and some of her new work, mapping a landscape of uh, early Jewish literature that includes not only the books that people had access to, but their entire way of imagining um, how they fit into a broader literary matrix and tradition in their own, in their own time. So I'm going to leave it there uh, because we want to leave most of the time for, for discussion with uh, Karina and Karen. Thank you so much for tuning in. So first of all, let me say thank you to Sarit and Magda for inviting me to be a respondent to Ava's book and also to Siobhan for making this whole event work. Uh, and second, let me say to Ava how much I enjoyed rereading the literary imagination in Jewish antiquity for this event. So this was the third time I had read it and I can honestly say that I enjoyed it more each time. The first time I read it, I was actually a little bit dismayed to be honest because I realized I was gonna have to change the way I approached my graduate survey course on Second Temple Ju Judaism. The idea of biblical interpretation had been an organizing theme of the course, but how could Second Temple texts be engaged in biblical interpretation before there was a Bible? It seems so obvious when you say it, and yet, as you point out, it's almost a reflex among scholars in our field to ask about how Second Temple texts are interpreting or relating to the Bible. The second time I read it uh, was with the students in my uh, Second Temple Judaism class last spring. 
So it was the second book I had assigned for the semester right after Shia Cohen's for the Maccabees to the Mishnah. It might have given the students a bit of whiplash to read those two books one after the other, but your book was a breath of fresh air for them and for me. It changed the way we approached the primary text we studied for the rest of the semester, especially Jubilees, I have to say. I followed your lead and had them trace the motifs of books, writing, and Hebrew language throughout the text instead of doing comparisons of selected passages of Jubilees with Genesis or Exodus. This time though, it was the chapter that includes the discussion of Jubilees, shapes of scriptures, that stood out the most for me. The idea of scripture as satisfying the longing for a universal and complete library, like the Library of Babel that Borges imagined, is really compelling, especially from the perspective of rabbinic Judaism. But as you point out, in the Second Temple period, the texts that we now call the Hebrew Bible or Tanakh were not the totality of Revelation, but rather existed in a horizontal relationship with other literature for which we still lack a comprehensive designation. I love the way you trace the 300 year history of collecting this literature and conceptualizing its relationship to canonical scripture from Fabricius's Pseudepigrapha in 1713 to outside the Bible in 2013. I wanna probe the relationship of the totality of revelation to what became the Tanakh by drawing a connection between two of the primary texts that you deal with in other chapters of your book. This connection will no doubt seem obvious to you, but perhaps not to some of our audience members. So the first is the passage that you actually included in your presentation, the famous praise of wisdom in chapter 24 of the book of Ben Sira, which is unfortunately not extant in Hebrew, but which scholars agree is a poem about the relationship of wisdom, chokhmah, and Torah, which is rendered as nomos or law in the Greek of Ben Sira 24. You point out that immediately after identifying wisdom with the law that Moses commanded us, the po poem goes on to describe it, as, or to, sorry, to compare it to the great rivers of the world and then to the sea. Ben Sira's own teaching, which he also compares to prophecy, is like a canal from a river. But then it also flows into a river, which flows into the sea, which presumably still represents Torah in some sense. So within a few verses, we find Torah identified as both a specific book or books and as the totality of wisdom or perhaps of revelation. The connection I wanna make is to the two sets of books dictated in 4th Ezra 14. Again, we have the totality of revelation represented by the number 70 and by water imagery. Quote, for in them is the spring of understanding, the fountain of wisdom and the river of knowledge, 4th Ezra 1447. But the 24 books, which I believe represent the proto-canonical scriptures, although the rabbinic way of counting the Tanakh as 24 books was probably not yet established, they're both a part of the totality of Revelation and set apart from it in terms of purpose and audience. In 4th Ezra, the totality of Revelation is accessible only to an elite group called the wise, whereas the 24 books are available to, quote, the worthy and the unworthy. So what's fascinating to me is that all 94 books are revealed to Ezra in response to his request to rewrite the Torah. Again, assuming that the Hebrew original behind the terms for law in the extant versions was Torah. So that leads me to my first question. Your book convincingly shows that the anachronistic terms Bible and book distort the way we perceive the liter literature of the second temple period. I would like to hear what you think about the term Torah which is different from Bible in that it's frequently used by our second temple period sources. But is it similarly misleading in that it does not always mean what modern readers assume that it means, which is the five books of Moses? Do you think that the contents of the Torah became fixed before the larger biblical canon, or do you think they were still in flux at the time Ben Sira referred to the book of the covenant of the most high God, the law that Moses commanded us as an inheritance for the congregations of Jacob? Should, should I should I jump in now? Yes, yeah, I, I actually really love this question um, because it's one of the few things that has a really helpful um, contemporary or longstanding analogy because even now Torah is a really, really capacious and flexible and shape-shifting concept. And I think it was um, sometimes by design in the ancient texts um, as well. So I, I want to first distinguish maybe um, between the texts of what we now um, call the Torah or the, the five books of Moses. And yeah, I mean, I, 
I recognize the evidence that's right there, right, on parchment, that most of those texts were relatively, you know, relatively stable. So we don't have um, this, you know, dizzying array of different Deuteronomies. Like, we, we don't have that. So, right, so, so those texts were there, right? We've got differences in, in versions of Exodus and so on, and we've got larger and smaller variants, but those texts were there. But what ancient writers meant when they said Torah, I think, um, absolutely is as flexible and capacious as as it is now. Um, I mean, even a uh, you know great great rabbinic example that that everyone brings up in class, the story of Rabbi Hillel, who's asked to teach a convert the Torah while standing on one foot, and he says, uh, "What's hateful to you, don't do to others," and that's the whole Torah. Uh, everything else is commentary, now go and learn it. And at the same time, the rabbinic uh, uh, theological uh, scheme that the entire Torah, including all of its possible future interpretations, were all revealed on Sinai already, right? So it's like an accordion that shrinks and grows. Um, now, in terms of the specific references, um, when, pe when people talk about Torah in, in, in early texts, I think, I think it, it, it is absolutely misleading uh, to think that, that it's, um, it's, uh, it, it has to refer to the text that we have. So I, I, I agree. Um, so for example, in the passage in, um, in Nehemiah where the scribe Ezra publicly reads a Torah, a scroll of the law, a scroll of Torah, we don't really know even if that reflects a historical moment of public reading, we don't know what that was, uh, but narratively in the text itself, it is already uh, playing certain rhetorical roles and um, uh, material that is not actually in any version of the Pentateuch that we have is claimed to be part of part of the Torah of Ezra, which is of course something my, my teacher Hindi Nyman has written extensively on. Um, and uh, so, so, so we've got this, this sort of placeholder, I think, that can be uh, filled in different ways over time. So I think it is a generative genre or concept that gets passed down. Um, I think one other really interesting example of how Torah functions and how we need to identify what it's doing in a narrative first is uh, the letter of Aristeas, uh, which is the legend, uh, a legendary version of the translation of the Hebrew scriptures into Greek in um, the uh, the court of King Ptolemy in Alexandria, where there are these wonderful scenes of scrolls of the Torah being presented in the court, and they uh, create this aura of antiquity and authority, but nobody knows what's actually in them, right? The contents aren't particularly uh, clear or or maybe really, really even that important in the context of the narrative. Um, so that has a, a rhetorical or a narrative effect, but I don't think it tells us very much about what what was being um, what what the Torah actually literally was textually, um, just as a, a kind of brief kind of more concrete aside, um, the idea that the Torah is a set of five books is actually pretty late, right? As 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 you know, not until Philo in the first century do we have an explicit um, explicit recognition that the Torah is is a set of five. So we've got a very uh, flexible sort of capacious idea or, or, or genre that can kind of stretch and change to, um, to accommodate all kinds of ideas about law instruction that is connected in some way with, um, with a chain from Moses. All right, thank you. Um, I have another question that I think we should move on to though we probably will come back to this question of Torah, but what's your view on the, on the relationship between canonization and the development of the distinctive hermeneutics of scripture? So you include in your book, a quotation from Jay-Z Smith on page 180 that suggests that a closed canon is a precondition for exegetical ingenuity. And yet James Kugel, as we know, has devoted his career to illustrating the ingenuity of the ancient interpreters um, at least some of whom would have developed their hermeneutical assumptions and ingenious interpretations prior to the existence of the canon. So I'm puzzled because Kugel's four assumptions of ancient interpreters do seem to imply that the boundaries of scripture are known, but those same assumptions can be found even in so-called inner biblical exegesis, such as we find in the book of Chronicles. I'm inclined to think that the development of a hermeneutics specific to texts that are considered divine revelation happened first, and subsequently necessitated defining the boundaries of scripture. One reason I think this is that Jubilees performs similarly ingenious exegesis on the book of the Watchers part of First Enoch as it does on Genesis in order to harmonize them. 
Both are treated equally as divine revelation and with similar hermeneutical assumptions. And yet first Enoch eventually ended up on the outside of the canonical boundary along with Jubilees, except in the Ethiopian Orthodox canon. So I wonder if you could reflect a bit for us on this chicken or egg problem of the relationship between scriptural hermeneutics and canon. Yeah, uh, I, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, I think that we are doing um, interpretation, reuse, dialogue with uh, the texts from our past all the time, no matter if they're collected into a fixed set. I, I think that's just culture, right? That, that's just what happens all the time. Um, and I think what uh, with 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 Kugel's model, which I've used myself in class and benefited from it all uh, a lot, um, the the issue is that the the way that the sources are presented there um, absolutely creates the impression of um, of a rabbinic Bible with midrash around it when there isn't one, just because of the way that it's presented materially to us in the books and in the discussion. Um, so, and I think what where where things get kind of messy is if we start to think of scripture as one genre, right, as something that is authoritative and uh, set and inspired, and interpretation as another separate genre, as something that is not inspired or less inspired and and secondary to scripture. And those are not two different genres, right? So, as 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 you uh, pointed out. Um, Jubilees, which is often uh, framed as interpretation of Genesis and Exodus, is the same genre in some ways as Genesis and Exodus, right? It is a narrative, and in fact, it presents itself as prior. Um, it doesn't present itself as secondary or as explicitly uh, interpretive, and this is something that's very familiar to a lot of people who are um, who are present here. I'll just uh, point to David Lambert's recent work where he um, um, he calls it pre-written scripture, that it's not setting itself up as an interpretation of scripture, but it is prior scripture in its own presentation. Um, the, the generic distinction between scripture and interpretation becomes, I think, more possible to make once we get to Pesher, which is uh, the lemma and commentary genre that we find at Qumran, and then Rabbinic Midrash, which is not the same thing, but they have some um, some similarities. Um, so, so I think this the, the this issue of dividing up texts um, according to genre is sometimes gets us into into trouble where we have to think about um, Genesis and Jubilees as two like fundamentally different types of writing, um, and. Uh, here, I think Molly Zahn is doing um, some of the most uh, kind of sharp and clear thinking about how we can categorize texts in different ways, um, including in different uh, generic in different generic categories without presupposing those um, uh, those divisions. Uh, so no, I I think absolutely we're we're all the time interpreting um, and drawing on prior texts without the necessity of of any kind of closure. I think the Smith thing was um, there was a I think a moment in the eighties in literary um, in literary criticism where rabbinic midrash was a kind of uh, example. Uh, or constructed example of a closed canon with interpretive vitality inside was very popular, but I, I don't think it really holds for for what we're talking about. Um, but I do have one suggestion for getting out of this problem, and that comes with a pitch of a book by Brooke Ayala Sale on First Enoch as Christian scripture. Um, and this is, he's an Ethiopian scholar and presents a reception history of First Enoch, not as something that helps us scholars understand Genesis or us understand early Judaism, but as, as scripture for a particular community. And we all know this, we all know that about the Ethiopian canon being, being larger, but I think few of us have been exposed to what that really means and how to kind of naturalize thinking of these texts that play a particular rhetorical role for us, but that play a completely different role in um, in another community. So, um, so I recommend this book uh, as a way to actually shake up our own sense of what Second Temple literature was by looking at Enoch from the perspective of a much later Christian reception. All right, thanks. I think I'll move on to my final question. So um, 
Textual scholars in the 19th and 20th century distinguished between textual criticism, or sometimes called lower criticism, which attempted to establish the original text of a particular work, and historical criticism or higher criticism, which focused on the historical context within which a text should be interpreted. So your work seems to be part of a trend in textual studies in general that's blurring the boundaries between composition and transmission of texts and calling into question the possibility of recovering original texts. So is there still a role for textual criticism? And if so, how did the assumptions of contemporary text critics differ from those of an earlier era? Okay, I, I really love this question too because I've, I've been asked this a lot by text critics um, who think that I don't want them around anymore. And that's not true. Um, but what, what I think is really key, what, what I love about your question is sort of the, um, uh, the flagging of the search for the original text, which I don't think is is uh, the main motivation or the main thing that textual critics um, want to be doing now. And I think what um, textual criticism is is a really important enterprise that helps us historicize right the development of texts over time, um, and that includes the different stages of their development and what those different how those different stages functioned and were um, were significant in their own uh, context over time. So we're no longer just looking for um, right the uh, the ipsisi maverba the, the the word of God uh, that was originally given to a prophet. Um, but I think what text critics have been uh, have been paying attention to is the human presence in transmitting these texts. And I'm looking here at at at, at Karen, who's uh, who's written so much about like real concrete traces of human presence and scratches and rocks. And I see really textual criticism as doing some of the same kinds of things, right? How um, editors work, the mistakes that they made, uh, the changes that they made to their texts over time, right? How the texts grow and move in the different historical stages. And with this, I also can't help but um, recall in graduate school when I worked at a dig uh, in Israel for a summer. And I was completely new to archaeology. I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, and then I was uh, horrified to overhear someone say, oh, that's the Persian lair. Put it in the rubble pile. And I thought, what? You're throwing away all of these other layers of occupation, of culture. That's just trash because you want to get back to a particular moment, you know, usually pre-exilic, you know, monarchic Israel. Um, but I think that that's um, that's an analogy to sort of the the old stereotype of what textual critics wanted to do, and I don't think that's what textual critics do, right? So I'm thinking, for example, of my colleagues in New Testament, um, Tommy Wasserman and Jennifer Knust, who uh, just uh, came out with this, uh, I guess not just a year or two ago, came out with this amazing book about um, the passage in the Gospel of John about Jesus talking to the woman caught in adultery and how that passage travels over time between manuscripts and communities and what it reveals about the people who use those texts and the human marks that they made on, um, on the text that they used. Uh, looking forward also, uh, something that's really closely in conversation with your work, Karina, uh, leave lead on um, the way that uh, manuscripts of Second Baruch uh, were cha changed over time and functioned in medieval Syriac contexts and looking at kind of the human um, uh, stories and moments that we can trace of transmission of these texts over time. So I am 100% on board. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Ava. And I think it's probably time to hand it over to Karen for her questions. Okay, hello. Um, and thank you, and I really enjoyed that. So it's nice to be able to be both you know, contributor and we are here. <laughs> um, this is really a pleasure. Um, so after um, an entire year of pandemic sequestering, I, I as, as Karina just described, I, I know that I relish the opportunity to revisit uh, the literary imagination in Jewish antiquity this year, even more than I did last year when we originally planned to meet together in person. So that I guess anticipates that if we read the seven times, our lives are gonna, seven, eight times, our lives are gonna get better and better. And as I mentioned uh, to Eva briefly the other day, I was able to re-experience this book after more than a year without significant travel outside of New York City um, as a true form of escapism, 
um, given all the book's rigor, the felicitous style of her writing and the virtual time travel the narrative invites, transported me quite happily, believe me, uh, first to uh, the seat of the Nestorian church in 8th century Baghdad, then uh, deeper into antiquity, into the literary worlds of Jews who secreted their texts in caves along the Judean desert and later in Cairo. Then forward in time to 17th century England during the height of the Civil War where Milton is trying to sort of defend the book against uh, censorship. And then to the dramatically changed realities of the German states more than, well, almost uh, 200 years later after Luther's initial critiques of the church at a time when Protestant scholars and theologians struggled to collect and label ancient scriptures that accorded with their senses of theological propriety. These journeys ultimately returning the reader, me, to the modern world, very disappointing, and its scholarly scope served as a welcome balm during times of um, physical stasis. So in that light, I finally wish to thank uh, the Center for Jewish Studies at Fordham and at CUNY for the invitation to participate in this book club event, of course, uh, to Siobhan and Sarit for facilitating it, and Ava for indirectly extending to me and to all those of you who have already read or plan to read the book, another invitation to enter a very different world, um, the imagined literary universe of Jews and Christians in antiquity and far beyond. Um, and this book really does, I think, invite an inclined reader into these cultures, which at the same time seem so familiar, but from a very different past, of course. Um, cultures, as we've heard today, whose understandings of scripture were more fluid, inclusive, and unstable than many imagine today. So certain features of this book particularly stand out to me, and several of them have been highlighted by Karina, and we've already heard about in these conversations. Um, the first of these includes sort of the broader effort to identify occlusion in, in centuries of biblical scholarship that really becomes sort of ossified, including anachronistic taxonomies related to scholars, various theological commitments, which continually impede our improved understandings of the native worlds and mentalities, and that's word that Ava uses, um, native, of producers and curators of ancient scriptures. She definitely demonstrates in chapters such as shapes of scripture, so I thought it was really interesting that this chapter also resonated with Karina in certain ways. Um, so she demonstrates how the mental architecture, this is again her term, which I really uh, enjoy, that structures how we imagine the shape, limits, locations, and hierarchies of ancient sacred writing palpably distorts our improved understandings of them. And she argues that beginning, this is a quote, beginning with questions about the Bible's origins and interpretation and assuming its centrality to early Jewish literature obscures the possibility of describing a pre-biblical literary imagination in which textual traditions took fundamentally different shapes, end quote. So toward the end of that chapter, following her discussion of Jubilees, she argues that certainties about ancient canon and canonization are now more aptly recast as, quote, bibliographic mystery, a bibliographic mystery in which not all the texts she says are easily identifiable and none claim to be the entirety of what has been revealed. This uncertainty and instability of scriptural collections might be uncomfortable to some, surely they have been, but her conclusion that this approach opens up a world where revealed writing was not centralized in a single corpus, but found in various locations demonstrates an ancient or sort of vivifies an ancient scriptural world newly ripe for re-examination a less bounded world of literally unbounded texts. To be honest, this approach and the broader project resonates deeply with me and my own research in multiple respects. While much of my work considers archeological and inscriptional data, including graffiti, among the most challenging aspects of analyzing these materials is to conjure more productive categories for their evaluation to avoid reifying old categories that in turn reinscribe consensus theories about how ancient Jews and Christians must have behaved or self-identified or worshiped or related to each other in antiquity. As she notes, indeed, taxonomy and hermeneutics actually matter because they shape our understandings of ancient texts, objects, and histories. So in that light, I appreciate Ava's emphasis on privileging native literary theories from antiquity or early modernity rather than modifying social historical approaches which often overlie less critical views of ancient scriptures and their containment. In other words, while her arguments certainly advance the discussion of texts and scripture, their implications also resonate across multiple disciplines and subdisciplines in the study of religion and Jews in antiquity. 
Indeed, implicit throughout this entire work is a broader effort to make the familiar strange, which we heard about earlier and she just described, or to put it more eloquently in Ava's words, quote, even the sources that are more familiar to us can become strange when seen outside of our most naturalized categories and our most pressing teleological interests. By focusing on variable collections of Psalms, as well as Ben Sira and Jubilees and Enoch and others, um, she works from text sometimes viewed as peripheral to decenter the center. Why indeed should the center be considered as such and who gets to decide? And this last point leads me um, to another, and this will be my last sort of summation before I ask questions. And this is a little bit of a soapbox for which I apologize, but this leads me just to a broader point. Um, something I appreciate about scholarship like this that makes familiar texts suddenly unfamiliar or collections unfamiliar. It is the fact that um, in this book, she addresses scriptural traditions that are prioritized through many areas of the world, including North America and Africa and Asia to be sure. Indeed, it is their familiarity in modern societies and their relevance to modern religious traditions, which most assure their ongoing study in the modern university, at least as long as funding holds out. Okay, but why? But this is why scholarship like this needs to be produced and why students should encounter it in the classroom, just as uh, Karina's students have. As we've seen in recent months, as peri periodically recurs uh, through time, this is preaching to the choir here, biblical texts and associated interpretive traditions are ever more frequently marshaled to defend policies and cultural positions in the present. By addressing texts so central to modern society, the familiar, and making them unfamiliar, reading them from a critical vantage. This book performs among the only types of activism that we as scholars have in our arsenal to make the familiar strange, to help others understand that the present, including current readings of, of biblical texts, is not inevitable, but rather a product of historical contingency and hermeneutical choice. Now more than ever, I think that we need to make arguments such as these, whether they hinge on you know, Psalm 150 or Psalm 151 or not. So thank you um, so much for, for sort of sharing your book with all of us. And I just wanna use the opportunity to ask you a bit more about the larger world in which these scriptures were produced. Um, it's very clear, especially because of your introduction of the new projects that you're working on, which sound fascinating, that much of your work addresses sort of an intellectual history, an intellectual heritage of these books. Um, who shares them with whom, where they're hidden, how they're revealed, all of these sorts of things. So I apologize if my questions are going to be sort of uh, centered to the concrete a little bit more and perhaps entirely unanswerable in many ways. Um, but my first question uh, just relates to sort of these differences that we see in collections, right? Whether it's differences in collections of Psalms um, that we see throughout time and, cl and place in antiquity and beyond. And I'm just wondering if we can assume or not that discrepancies between these collections, so these scriptural collections, do the differences owe exclusively to differences in scribal behaviors, including practices of copying, editing and collecting texts. And I sort of wonder if you think there might be any correlation between discrepancies in scribal collections and corresponding variations in local or regional oral traditions, literacies, imaginations among associated actors or groups. I know that this, this is really hard to, to try to uh, discern, uh, but I'm just wondering if there's any sort of gesture to this at all, and if it's possible to sort of push discussions of scriptural variabilities in this way, or to even consider questions like these um, in that sort of broader schema. Yeah, the, uh, thank you. Uh, I mean, th thank you for that whole wonderful uh, stimulating response. Um, and and the, the, the question, the, the particular question here, um, I mean, as as you anticipated, our our evidence is really pretty scant for this period. Um, it gets, you know, things get a little bit different when we reach late antiquity. Um, but the evidence from Qumran itself is already pretty varied, right? So I think we can say a few things, right? Qumran is our primary uh, source of material evidence that lets us do some of this more concrete work. Uh, we have, of course, some scrolls at Masada that look um, a little bit closer to the textual form of what became the, the received text, the Masoretic text. Um, but increasingly scholars have seen Qumran as not a kind of isolated, and just for the benefit of people who are not in the field, um, 
one early theory was that this was a really isolated, wacky scribal community that created all of these uh, these, these these wacky, abnormal traditions, and do doesn't really have much to do with uh, with the broader context. But in fact, that's not that's not the case. The 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 scrolls that uh, uh, the manuscripts uh, found at uh, Qumran actually reveal so many different scribal hands over many generations that the vast majority of them were brought in from other places rather than produced at the site. And most of them don't have anything to do with a really specific minor group. So I think we have a kind of interesting cross section of different, um, different time periods and scribal habits right there in that collection from Qumran. Now, of course, because it's so hard to figure out where they came from before they got there, um, we can't really make, we can't really say anything more concrete about whether they represent um, geographical, you know, local variants. Um, but within that, I mean, we can make some of the more imminent arguments that arise from the habits we see there. And um, I'll just gesture to uh, the work of Sidney White Crawford, who identified two categories of scribal approaches. I think it's approach A and approach B, where one of them, some scribes simply basically copied and other scribes, um, maybe they, they had a different kind of scribal training or motivation um, or were part of a different tradition, would do more kind of revision or embellishment of materials. And she uh, identifies both approaches as being present uh, in the corpus of the Dead Sea Scrolls itself. Um, now, the, the other thing that I think we can, we can talk about is, um, is the role of Aramaic scribal culture and um, hear the work of uh, Annette Yoshiko Reed, Seth Sanders, Jonathan Bendov, um, we can see that a lot of the Aramaic uh, texts um, correspond or have a lot in common with Mesopotamian materials and Mesopotamian science and scribal training. Um, so I think here we can think about how that um, and this is not something I've worked deeply on myself, but I think here we can start to ask those questions about um, how um, patterns that we see in a kind of broader educational system of, of uh, scribes trained in Aramaic, whether they were Jewish or Mesopotamian, uh, might help us understand how um, the Aramaic texts or the earlier uh, Qumran materials were, um, were produced. And of course, things, um, things are, are different uh, when, when Alexandria becomes a cultural center with uh, traditions of, of Greek scholarship. Um, so I, I am always just deeply unsatisfied with my own answers to questions like this. Um, so, so I apologize uh, if that is not a satisfying answer. It is really hard because we just don't have a ton of super concrete evidence. But what something you mentioned um, made me think about, you know, whether we can think about uh, oral transmission or kind of a more um, uh, uh, knowledge that, that we can't just get from the manuscripts that we have. Um, I actually think this is, this is a really important question because some of the work I'm doing right now is about little bits evidence for tiny little bits of knowledge that are scattered all over different texts with no particular connections to each other. Um, and uh, the, the particular example is that I'm, um, I'm working on a, on a project about uh, the motif of King Hezekiah as um, uh, his, in his interpretive afterlife, he becomes a biblical censor and a sorter of texts. And this comes up in uh, Jewish and Christian texts of various genres over a thousand years. And none of the examples I've found seem to be directly scribally connected to each other. Nobody's copying from anybody else in these examples. They're just coming up like these mushrooms at random places. So how do we think about that, right? This is literary evidence, but it clearly reveals some kind of broader knowledge base where these ideas get activated in a way that you can't really trace just through the textual evidence itself. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think we need or I need a better way to talk about um, about the non um, the non literary matrices of the literatures that we have. Sorry about that. Thank you so much. I mean, I think most of my questions are really in the same genre of unanswerable information. And it's always like the most pressing questions that people have often are the ones that we wish we could answer. But, you know, 
the materials resist us. And my two other questions are really related and I don't know which order to ask them in because they both very much sort of accord with your, uh, the way that you just responded to the previous question. Um, but maybe I'll, I'll ask the, sort of like the shorter one first, because um, what you were just describing with different manuscript traditions and what was happening among people working with Aramaic, as opposed to with other um, texts of other languages might, might be related. So I was just wondering if you had, again, question for the unanswerable, um, any insights into, this is what Suri was talking about earlier, sort of the circulation of these scriptural collections. Um, how are they traded? Is that, do we have any way to find, again, this is trying to find some sort of historical tie outside of sort of this idea that scribes were somehow communicating with each other in some transcendent way. So do you have any insight into how these scriptural collections were traded? You know, how did this version of Psalms get here or there or Jubilees? Um, and I was wondering if you could say um, something more about sort of networks of intellectuals um, or scribal elites um, in earlier or later antiquity, which might be easier, and how they seem to have acquired or copied or communicated texts or stories yet unwritten to each other. And I was just wondering if considering that question, even again, if it's sort of directed to the unanswerable here, um, just whether reviewing these different ways of connection, right, whether it's through network theory or, or other types of things, whether it could differently illuminate sort of processes of scriptural exchange, dynamism, creativity, interpretation, and this sort of thing. Yeah, um, I, I think in many ways we have to, we are relegated um, to analogies with later periods for which we have more evidence um, that may or may not be you know, directly similar. So um, I've benefited a lot from work in classics on um, on reading culture in in Rome, uh, especially uh, uh, William Johnson and Kendra Eshelman's work on kind of these 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 elite networks and how um, they're pretty small, right? <laughs> pretty pretty small groups of of people that would kind of trade. Um, I think the the problem in our field is that um, a lot of the evidence that we a lot of the non material the literary evidence that people use for um, for social history is of course so political and so literarily constructed like you look at Josephus and the New Testament, which is the way you know most of us come imagining the different you know different Jewish groups and factions and um, and and uh, uh, types of networks that people belong to that the first thing that you have to do is really look at those texts as texts right as constructed texts. Um, the same thing, I mean the same problem happens with uh, scholarship, particularly on education in ancient Israel. Um, in the field of biblical studies, where a lot of the time we rely on something like the book of Proverbs uh, to reveal kind of the social concrete histories of of how people were taught in ancient Israel without first kind of looking at what the text is doing um, as literature. Here I point to Jacqueline Weintraub's work, who's uh, you know showing how um, what we can definitely do is discern the text's own ideology and how it presents itself and the social values it communicates. So again, this is a giant cop out, um, but uh, but here we are with most of these texts. I I run off and escape and hide in the literature. Um, but then once we get into slightly later materials, um, particularly uh, uh, early Christianity we start to get some really cool evidence. Um, so for example, um, the, uh, um, I uh, engaged this letter from Timothy the first, who's a patriarch of the so-called Nestorian church in Baghdad in 800 CE. And he writes about having heard a rumor about texts that were found in a cave. Um, and then he complains that um, he tried to write to get more information, but nobody answered his letter and it's really sad. Um, but there's a much earlier example of this sort of thing, uh, reports that Origen, uh, the creator of the Hexapod, this great you know, early Christian um, uh, uh, text criticism project, that he also kept on finding these different translations and versions, especially of Psalms, in random places in Antioch and in a jar in Jericho. And this became, um, and, and interestingly enough, even though uh, we have these hints of um, 
of you know what what might have some kind of historical kernel um what uh I keep seeing is that these uh, stories become legends later. So we actually have three or four different versions of this account of origin finding psalms in a jar um, that that transform over time over a couple of, of generations of Christian retelling. So in uh, in one from probably the fifth or sixth century, um, the translation found in a jar is rumored to be translated by a woman, right? So these these things take on lives of their own, and that's really related to my to my project. And again, I'm going back into the into the literature rather than into the social history because for the most part, what we have are these accounts that get turned into stories, right? That may have uh, reflected um, real kind of networks of discovery and of you know going to 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 to, to find scrolls in different places, but then they, they get turned into legends. Um, and one really legendary example of that is, of course, legends about Ezra the scribe um, that were most recently um, studied in depth by Rebecca Wallenberg. Um, um, where Ezra goes around and restores and recollects all the texts that were that were lost in the exile. So you can see this interest there that certainly reflects some real stuff, right? Some real things that people were trying to to do to uh, to collect um, and assemble and assemble texts. But then very quickly they get they get um, kind of narrativized in that way. Um, uh, one of my other favorite letters from Timothy the first is where he tries to send one of his monks to go to a rival monastery because he heard that they have manuscripts he wants, but he says, don't tell them who sent you. <laughs> I mean, and that's a real, I, I think that, you know, that really happened. That does, that, that is from him, from Timothy about a particular moment in time um, where he's uh, um, recounting some of these kind of underhanded attempts to get texts from other places. And it reminds me of another account of the, um, the, the rumors that the Library of uh, Alexandria would uh, send for copies of, send for texts from other places so they could make copies, but then they'd keep the originals and send the copies back. So lots of much later narratives about these, these underhanded intrigues of, um, of uh, the book trade that we get particularly in, in the later centuries. Um, so I think uh, one of my favorite articles that I ever read that kind of sent me off onto uh, this whole field is uh, Bob Kraft's uh, SBL presidential address beside and beyond um, biblical studies. And he says that uh, we should be writing and reading more historical fiction because a lot of these these things are um, important to be able to imagine, right? And in in some ways, we have to fill in those gaps with the imagination. Um, and I'm sorry, that was such a cop out. I think the Aramaic scribal training and Mesopotamian science is really uh, key to answering some of these questions concretely with the Dead Sea Scrolls. And otherwise, I think, um, looking broadly and comparatively at analogies from Rome and Alexandria, but at least help us imagine what the kind of broader matrix could have been. Um, I really appreciate that. And I think you've sort of uh, answered some of the question that, that was my last question, but I appreciate a lot of what you're saying, which is sort of in a way unexpected for me and really also thought provoking. Um, the ways in which some like folklore studies, um, like Galit Hassan Rukem, you know, the ways that we approach literature could be, um, and scriptures could be inflected by um, looking at different ways of approaching sort of similar problems of transmission of tradition and, and different versions of stories. And it also makes me think of something that was sort of unexpected to me when um, I read um, Hagith Sivan's Jewish Childhood um, in the Roman world. And so much of that is just, you know, she presents the evidence and then she presents these historical reconstructions and it's honest, you know, she presents it as, you know, did this happen? Was this the reality of Babta's son in the cave? We don't know, but this is a way to sort of vivify the evidence that sometimes raises important questions that maybe we can't answer, but still, you know, poses them. Um, or prompts them to be answered in different ways. So I'll just a little snippet of uh, the last piece of what I was going to ask you, and then we should probably turn to other people to see what um, their questions are um, from the other participants. Um, 
but again, it's it's probably going to come back to the same place. You're going to be like, stop asking the question about things that we cannot know. Um, but I'll go back to a place really early in the book where you differentiate your approach to these texts, which obviously have, have been addressed in other ways. And you sort of um, differentiate your approach from others who are more interested in how textual authority functioned and developed in the early Jewish social world, right? Focusing on that more broadly. And you describe, and this is sort of a quote, sort of from, from uh, your work, that your focus is uh, more imminent, imminent, pardon me, focusing on native literary theories, what we can decode from the text themselves about how their elite producers understood their own literary world. And this is part of what you're saying, I mean, this is this is a literary strategy, right? These people are trying to efface markings of who they are. And in a way, I think that um, your your discussion of Ben Sira as not necessary, like you think it's the author, it's not the author, but this way in which there's sort of this deliberate strategy of uh, sort of the smoke and mirrors thing happening, it, it seems to be sort of very much part of the genre. But still, you know, as I was sort of carried through, as I said before, you know, to Baghdad, to Ethiopia, to all these different places, it seemed really seamless to me because these are sort of scribal cultures in which there is sort of a continuity of discourse and a continuity of priority and this sort of thing. Um, and I'm gonna say it again, but I'm just wondering, is there a way, because your concern is with sort of um, it, at least as, as I read it, right? How the elite producers understood their own literary world. And is there still a way that we can tie this to place and time? Is it really, you know, as, as it seems to be promoted that it's sort of this seamless uh, intellectual conversation across uh, decades and geography or does the Dead Sea Scroll, do the Dead Sea Scrolls maybe in particular help us maybe give us a little bit more information to try to understand what, who were these elite producers of copious editors of texts? Is there any way that we can use, let's say the Dead Sea Scrolls as a model to try to approach it more broadly? Yeah, I mean, I think there are some things we can say. Um, I think that we can certainly say that um, they even know that there's a there's this cliche that uh in the time periods we're talking about judeo was, was this backwater province uh the people who produced these texts and the people who collected them at Qumran were pretty cosmopolitan and we see that um they were interconnected with other cultures whether it's through kind of aramaic scribal training with um you know influence from scientific cosmic lore from from the east um there's a, another kind of truism in second temple judaism that there was no such thing as a non-hellenistic jew in this period right this was kind of embeddedness in a culture um and and i think also uh the idea that uh these people were multilingual as a rule rather than as an exception and even in the scrolls themselves right we've got three languages uh represented in this kind of isolated um isolated compound and they still had hebrew aramaic and greek materials um represented i think with the example of ben Sira, there's an interesting um there's an interesting question here where I don't think I can reconstruct. So, so for those who are um, not as familiar with this, Ben Sira um, the, is, is the first person that seems to give us his own name, uh, own individual name, rather than someone writing as a great legendary from the past, uh, legendary hero from the past, or being anonymous. So he actually gives us his name. Um, so I don't think we can reconstruct his uh, uh, personal biography based on the things he says, because a lot of them are Kind of generic and conventional. Um, but uh, as uh, Ben Wright, who I think was here, Ben Wright and I um, uh, just uh, uh, published an article together where we actually tried to place what Ben Sira thinks about himself and his work sort of in place and time, because a lot of the time we have um, assumed that Ben Sira's revelation of his own individual authorship, his name, is kind of is, is Greek influence 
where you know there's the cliche or the stereotype is that there's more attention to the individual um but we in fact tried to place ben sira more in the tradition of jewish pseudepigraphy that it's not that he let his pseudepigraphical persona just fall away so the truth could come out but that he wanted to make himself into a pseudepigraphic hero whose name and fame would last, right? So, I mean, I think in those ways, I, I do think of um, literary values as being tied to, to time and place too. And uh, sometimes um, they're the only things that we can really figure out from the evidence we have. Um, and of course, with the history of Ben Sira, it becomes even more interesting because um, unlike most texts, we have uh, the history of the translation of the text and the way that it travels between Hebrew and Greek translated by someone who claims to be Ben Sira's grandson. Um, so, so I think there are gems like that that can help us imagine sort of the way that um, that these people are tied to their own to their own times, but that their texts kind of take off um, in um, in in other ways. Um, I think that's. I'm going to stop there. Um, so I want to jump in and say this is really a lot of fun. So thank you. Um, I also think that it is really um, apropos that so many of the questions, Karen, that you were asking were about things we can't know, because I think that so much of what, um, what the work that Ava is doing is tied to this question of the limits of knowledge and epistemology themselves. Um, so the, the discourse of lost texts and found texts and imagined and inaccessible and capacious texts in antiquity are really about ancient people grappling with what is and isn't possible to know about the world and about God and the divine. And so sort of participating, ourselves participating in this sort of, you know, in a time and a place where so much is possible to know and where we can have so much of the library like in our computer, there's something really beautiful, I think, about not being able to access something because that's exactly what these discourses on texts are really about. Um, and I, I'll just highlight that I think in many ways it's very related to the work um, that you, Karen, and that you, Karina, also do, right? That the Book of Fourth Ezra is all about sort of the limits of what can be known um, and death and commemoration as also sort of this um, trying to put words um, into what is like beyond this world. And so I just want to bring that a little bit together, um, even in sort of the beauty of not being able to know every everything that we might want to know. And that sort of that helps us imagine maybe the impulse. I think I, I, this, this is, I, I'm so glad you said that because it allows me to bring something up that, that I hope to have a chance to do, which connects um, something Karina said with, with what, what Karen just, um, just mentioned about this kind of undifferentiated mass of stuff, right? And I, I, I admit I'm a lumper and not a splitter, but I think there's something that, that um, I want to be kind of deliberate about in terms of presenting some of these traditions, especially from later antiquity, as cutting across Jewish and Christian thinking, right? And that is one really important piece, that this idea that there's more out there is something that everyone knew. Like, it, it wasn't a, a kind of terrible, threatening um, uh, secret everybody assumed that there was a ton of other texts that were authentic and that were ancient and inspired that that either they didn't have or weren't in the canon. And here, you know, Karina, you mentioned, uh, you, you spoke about, uh, uh, you know, your work on Ben Sir, on, uh, on, on Fourth Ezra, and the idea that these 24 books that are probably, you know, some representation of what became canonical, um, they're not actually the best part, right? It's the non-canonical stuff that is the spring of knowledge and wisdom, right? So outside the canon, there's still this, this broad, general, absolutely fundamental assumption that cuts across many, many of these, of, of these religious traditions and times that, yeah, that's not all we have, right? We don't have it all. 
Um, so we only have a few minutes left, but if it's okay, I'd like to try to get to three questions. Um, and the first is um, from a student um, of ours, uh, actually a Jewish Studies Fellow, who's a medievalist. Um, and she writes that scholars in medieval studies frequently grapple with similarly thorny questions and assumptions about textual history, canon, and authorship. And so she was excited while reading your book about your arguments about the relationship between texts and um, quote unquote authors and their possibilities for other fields. Um, and so can you um, reflect a little bit on what are the takeaways from your own research for people who work in texts and scribal traditions and transmission in other, um, in other times and places? Um, well, I have to be honest. Um, I think our field has a lot to learn from medievalists. And I think that is uh, starting to happen with new art coming out now. Um, but I think people in medieval studies got a head start on kind of these questions of code ecology and how to think about collection um, and you know what it means to, to, to talk about a book or who's responsible for writing a book, right? And, and even metaphors of what books and writing were. So when I was kind of developing um, this, this research Research trajectory in graduate school, I ended up um, reading and working a lot with people who um, had already walked that path in medieval studies. So, uh, so that that you know we can we can turn it around that way. Um, and and I think the other side of that is really um, that what I think we can contribute as scholars of the ancient world, as scholars of pre-book, you know, with, the, with sort of the standard idea of book, scholars of pre-book culture, I think we um, have a lot to say to kind of the broader field of, of, of book history or the history of writing and text, because we are, um, you know, sort of in, in, in maybe a post-book, you know, post-print or whatever digital culture that I think is weirdly still stuck in print and codex paradigms. Right. So a lot of the ways that we think about books are still kind of, you know, still haven't caught up to the way that we really engage with texts and the way that on a day to day basis. And I think people who um, who have expertise in sort of the, the beginning of that can really show that um, that maybe we, we the history of writing and um, a textual technology is not really evolutionary right that it's a lot more complex than that because the standard narrative in sort of general histories of the book is that first we had these totally unwieldy impossible tablets and then we had these pretty unwieldy scrolls where you couldn't really do anything very exciting or creative and then the codex came and things were blown wide open and now we have the internet and it's a giant free-for-all and that's not actually the case right there's lots of constraints with the way we engage with text now the idea that scroll to codex is somehow stodgy to free is deeply supersessionist so i think people who work in um the who think about the possibility of you know what texts are like and the and the technology of writing and the history of, of kind of pre-codex pre-print stuff really can challenge that kind of evolutionary story um, that's actually a perfect segue to um, two questions that I'm going to co combine into one um, about the technology of text and to ask you to just reflect a little bit more about the role that you see that technologies of texts play in the formation of ideas such as canon and text collections that you write about on the one hand. And then on the other hand, um, notions of orality and midrash and the way that rabbinic texts a little bit later talk about um, uh, Bible um, and sort of the capaciousness of the what what you call right like this Torah as this all encompassing thing. So both on the one hand, like the technologies permitting the canon, and then also sort of discourses of oral and written Torah as um, challenging that. Or how does that fit in? Yeah. So with technology, um, I, I I don't believe that uh, technology is determinist, right? So I don't think that um, when suddenly there's a new technology of writing, the concepts of what how writing is thought about and used suddenly changes. Um, 
great example of this is uh, the invention of the codex form. Did I, I think it's easy to kind of assume that, you know, first uh, it, beforehand, we just had a bunch of scrolls that you could just like put in a bucket and add more to. But then when you had a codex form, that was more conducive to canon, right? Because you had to put everything in between two covers in a physical material way. But when you look at early codices in the way that um, even biblical texts were compiled, that is absolutely just not the case. Right. So early codices did not include um, anything like full collections and um, early codices that claimed to be full had a whole bunch of other stuff mixed in with biblical texts that we would not now put into a Bible. Right. So it's not that the codex form somehow created the canon. There was a very long, very long lag. Um, uh, uh, there. And also, of course, in, in Jewish traditions, there was a canon without a widespread use of, of, of codices in, in, um, in rabbinic tradition. So I think it's really all about um, uh, uh, community use and, you know, the development of things in conversation with technology, rather than a kind of um, a, a threshold. Um, I know I have like 30 seconds to talk about rabbinics. <laughs> I mean, there is no question that um, that there is a canon of the rabbinic Bible, right? And a midrashic tradition that um, that puts it in the middle, that literally puts it in the middle with commentary. Um, at the same time, um, the rabbis too, just like the Christians, absolutely knew that there was more out there than they had in their canon because the criteria for canon it didn't seem that the criteria for canon was that everything that is authentic, inspired, and um, and and uh, authoritative is in, and everything else is out, and everything outside the canon is is fake or or wrong or bad. That was not the way those decisions were made, right? There was a different set of institutional or pragmatic decisions that determined what um, what the canon was, and also, of course, histories of practice. Um, so again, when we think about well, what happens when there's a canon? The canon isn't always predicated on the same values that we might assume it is. And there's always more out there. And everybody in the pre-modern world knew that. Um, so as, as you said, uh, we're out of time, um, which maybe will um, allow me to say my, the question I would have asked had we not had um, to stop, which is about the relationship between textuality and temporality. And I won't, ask you as a question, but maybe as a way of summing up that I think there's such an interesting relationship in the material that um, that you shared today about texts being conceived as a flowing river and the Psalms being arranged calendrically and that it's Jubilees in particular that's a text about textual discovery, but also about chronological and calendrical order. And then sort of looking ahead to your next project about um, discovery and loss and the way in which um, textuality and how we conceive of time and loss and past and future are connected. Um, so I'll just put that out there um, a, a, as an idea to sum up. Also to say that there are lots of other questions that we could have gotten to uh, that we won't. And so um, we'll send you the list of questions, but I wanna read just um, one comment, um, which is a comment of appreciation for this conversation. Someone wrote, I don't actually have a question. I just wanted to express my deep appreciation for Ava's presentation, which was wonderful. And also the comments and enlightening questions coming from the two contributors, Karen and Karina. As you can see, I'm sitting in Europe following this talk and have found well worth staying up late listening to the presenters, some of the outcome or consequences of an awful COVID time. Um, so I wanna echo that and to say that um, one, of, um, one of the ways of managing through this really horrible time has been connecting with people across time zones and in different places um, over ideas that are really important. And I think as Karen said, um, we think of these things as both like really just interesting for their own sake, but actually also defamiliarizing the way we think of really central concepts is itself um, part of participating in the society that we live in and making um, the, the world um, in which we le live a little bit um, more legible in, in, in nuanced ways. And so I wanna thank 
you, Ava, for your book, and Karina and Karen for such deep, meaningful engagement today. Um, and I also want to thank the students who read the book and came, and the faculty members who assigned the book, um, and er really everyone um, for joining us. Um, and we are looking forward to seeing you uh, next week on Wednesday. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Just honored by the engagement here and deeply, deeply grateful to all of you. Yes, thanks for everyone who came. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.